Okay, this is William Blake's The Very Famous The Tiger. Okay, we're going to go through the, a little bit about William Blake, who he was, because the context's really important to know about when you're writing your exams. Okay, so a little bit about the context, we'll go on to the analysis, and we'll look at some of the different techniques that he used. So, to kick us off, William Blake was born in 1757 and died in 1827. Although he was a Christian, he was very critical of the Church of England and organised religion in general. He was a visionary. He really, he was a thinker and a visionary. He really sought to find answers to the big life questions that he had. He spent hours walking alone in nature as a child. He saw mostly religious visions and hallucinations both as a child and as an adult. Now, at the time, he was thought as he was mad, he was crazy. Perhaps nowadays, we would obviously diagnose it as being some sort of mental health issue that he has. But it's important to remember this about him. Many times throughout his life, around nature, around the house, he would see visions of God, of angels, of the devil. And this would have very much informed his mentality, the way he thought, and ultimately what he created. Between the ages of 8 and 10, he saw a vision of a tree filled with angels, bright angelic wings, bespangling every bow like stars. Obviously very poetic, as it's our William, but you get the idea he's seeing a tree full of angels as a young child, and this obviously is going to influence him. He also claims to have seen Satan on the staircase of his South Malton House home in London as a child again, Satan on the staircase. Again, think about how that's going to affect you as a child and your visions and your understanding of the world around you and religion. Remember, religion's very important at this time, in this period. It's very, very important. It was very, very dangerous to be critical of the church, let alone politicians. And this is what William Blake really did. So at the time, he wasn't a popular man. He's viewed in the literary terms, he's viewed as part of the Romantics and as a pre-Romantic more specifically as it was before. His, his connection with nature especially and the big questions preempted the Romantic movement. Influenced by the ideals of both American and French revolutions. So a bit of a rebel, somebody who doesn't like organised religion, doesn't agree with organised politics and society and believes that the people should really reign supreme, so to speak. And so he had a great interest in these revolutions and again that informed his writings as well. He didn't believe in society and minds being ruled by either religious nor political figures. He believed in equality, both sexual and racial equality, which is really quite incredible at that time. A time when obviously we're not long out of really slavery being abolished. There's still a lot of slaves, obviously, within the United Kingdom at this point. Women didn't achieve the vote until the 20th century. So for a man to be really somebody who believes in equality is something quite different at the time as well. And again, at odds with what many, what the mainstream society would have felt and thought. Although he was religious, and it's important to remember he was religious, he constantly, constantly questioned who or what God is, and therefore, obviously, who or what the devil is as well. He was not just a writer, he was a painter and a printmaker as well. As well as writing so much poetry, he created many paintings and engravings. You don't believe me? Have a look. Ghost of a flea. Terrifying. What is going on here? Some kind of satanic or some sort of monster, basically. I'll let, I'm not an art critic, so I'll let those of you who are perhaps interpret it a bit more. Certainly, if you're able to interpret these pictures, these paintings, and add it and relate it and link it into your essays as a little bit of background context, all the better. Satan's smiting job with sore boils. Careful how you say that. What's happening here? Madness. Absolute craziness. We've got someone weeping, it looks like. We've got... Is it God? Having something ripped, torn out of him? Or is it poured onto him? The, the, the big creature with the wings looks satanic. Who knows? I recommend you pause these pictures and really have a think about them. 
the good and evil angels. A very old kind of satanic looking person that's shackled by the ankle and a very muscular baby Jesus. Let's be honest. That's some kind of athlete. It's huge. But move on. The house of death. Yeah, the house of death. Terrifying. So always questioning this idea of being good and evil, God and the devil. It constantly informs his works. And finally, the tiger. This is what the, this is what he created to accompany his poem that we're going to go on and look at now. Now, before we do, in a nutshell, in general, what happens? The tiger deals with Blake's doubts about who or what could have created such a dangerous, magnificent beast. He's in awe of it. He's an ab he cannot believe how incredible this animal is, how perfect it is, yet how dangerous it is. He details its strength and dangerous body parts, although I've mentioned there, it fails to mention its teeth, which is quite surprising. He's in awe of its creator more than anything else. Who would dare to create this? And we see this word dare repeated four times throughout the poem. Who would have the audacity? Who would dare to create such a dangerous animal? God or something else, the devil perhaps. Numerous times we see the tiger being associated with both fire being the devil and light being God or Jesus. It asks 13 questions and offers no solutions. If you've read this poem in class and thought, what is this about? He's not offering you any answers. He's not trying to offer you answers. He's trying to make you think. He doesn't have an answer himself and he's not pertaining to have one. He wants you to think about it and to come to your own conclusion. So it's a very thought-provoking poem. Okay, before we get into the poem, this is from a, a Rudyard Kipling's F, but it's the same colours that we use throughout. Texts and boxes in yellow are kind of more questions for you to consider to enhance your understanding of the poem. Don't just take the analysis I'm giving you. It should really be a springboard, a catalyst for you to be creating your own meaning. Light blue indicates poetic techniques, your met metaphors, alliteration, things like this. Orange boxes in text are focusing on word choice, looking at the word choice itself or perhaps explaining it a bit more to you as well. And green usually indicates that it's analysis. Green being associated with growth, it's developing the analysis of the poem. As I say, please don't, rec uh, just please don't rely on my analysis. You should be coming up with your own as well. Okay, let's get into this name. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night forest plural we start off with this first line it's rhythmic it's repetition of tiger the alliteration of burning bright the meter and rhythm within it which we'll look at later tiger tiger burning bright it's like a chant it's like some kind of call to the higher power or lower power which created this monster tiger tiger burning bright we get the alliteration of burning bright this could try to represent the sound of the fire b b b b b b perhaps i'll leave that one up to you in the forests the moment we hear the word forest we think of great vast expanses of space covered in vegetation humongous trees canopies so there's little shadows within it they're dangerous, they're dark, there's, there, there's lots of animals that could cause us harm. Not only that, it's a forest of the night, the word choice of night, heightening our, how uncomfortable we are. It heightens the danger of both the forest and the tiger. And Blake nicely juxtaposes the burning bright, the flames of the tiger with the darkness of the forests. Now, he's not literally meaning the tiger's on fire. That would be crazy. What he's meaning is he's trying to emphasise the colours, the majestic, incredible colourings of the tiger. He then goes on to ask what immortal, immortal meaning all-powerful above all humans, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy, frame for thy fearful symmetry? Very quickly we read it as symmetry because we want to have it rhyme with I. It's an A-A-B-B -B rhyme scheme, so I and symmetry rhyme. Remember, Blake perhaps wouldn't have spoken the same way that we do nowadays. So that rhyme's very logical and it doesn't break the A-A-B-B -B rhyme scheme, which we'll go on and talk about later as well. 
This final fourth line starts with could. He's questioning what kind of creator could possibly create such a dangerous beast of an animal. Who could frame thy fearful symmetry? This idea of frame it evokes the idea of the creator being an imaginative creator. Now, Blake himself was an artist, a poet, a creator of sorts, a, a, an imaginative creator. So perhaps he's puffing his chest out a little bit here. Perhaps. And he's really, it's a self-congratulatory congratulatory a little bit, a little bit of a pat on the back for him. But he's really asking what kind of incredible being, what kind of amazing imaginative creator could frame thy fearful symmetry? The sublime is something which is too big to be framed. The sublime means something that's a huge, expansive, big, massive idea that's almost too difficult for us to fully understand, yet we're attracted to it, we're amazed by it, we're in awe of it. The sublime's too big to be framed. So who, what kind of creators had the ability to frame this perfection? The word choice of fearful as well, in this case meaning fearsome and the idea of symmetry. We're told that beautiful people, not myself obviously, have perfectly symmetrical faces. Things which are symmetrical, think about the Taj Mahal in India for example. Symmetry equals beauty. Within artistic expression and beauty in itself, within nature, we love symmetry. Think of butterflies and things like this. The symmetry we see in the patterns. It's a little bit of a juxta of an oxymoron being used. Fearful symmetry, fearsome symmetry. It's terrifying but beautifully perfect, and that's also the battle that I think goes on. It could be this could be a this line could encapsulate could symbolise Blake's whole problem with it. This idea that it's terrifying but beautiful, a little bit like the Creator, whether it's God or the devil. Think about the God of the Old Testament, a, a vengeful, wrathful God. This could very much play into Blake and what he's saying, the fearful symmetry. What kind of creator could have possibly created this? Okay, on to stanza two. He goes on to ask, in what distant, far away, otherworldly, not on this planet, in what distant deeps or skies, deeps being the devil with heaven, the skies, sorry, the, 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 the devil with hell, sorry, and the skies being heaven with God. The depths, the deeps, hell, the skies, heaven. Burnt the fire of thine eyes. We've got a link here with line one. We've got the, the burning bright and we've also got the repetition of the word I from line three. So it's reinforcing this idea of fire, this idea of creation. We use fire to create as we'll go on and see. We go on and you see these two lines, there's a supernatural feel to them. It feels otherworldly, supernatural. It emphasises the idea that this must have been created by something bigger than us. And with the mention of de deeps for hell and skies for heaven, he's really overtly questioning where was this created? Where was this beast created? In heaven or in hell? We ask in what wings, a symbol for power, a power for symbol for perhaps freedom as well, inspiration. It could be a nod to the old god of Greek mythology as well. We have many winged gods and things like this. It could be a nod to that, but it's the idea the creator is free, is free to create this, has the freedom and the power to be able to create this. We've got the mention of dare, the second mention of dare. It's mentioned four times throughout the poem. Who would dare to do this? And that's ambiguous. It can be read as who would have the courage, who would dare to do this, or who would be stupid enough almost, who would dare to create such a dangerous animal? So there's double meaning story to all. He's not sure himself. On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire, had the courage to seize the fire. And again, repetition of fire, linking it more with the devil than with God. This, as I've said already, is ambiguous. It's, it says, showing the courage of the creator for creating the tiger, or is he in disbelief that something or someone could be irresponsible enough to create this? Where choice of hand is also another body part. This poem is littered with body parts mentioned. Usually human body parts as well, interestingly, perhaps suggesting that the creator 
is more is closer to us as humans than animals. The tiger has paws, not hands. Okay, stanza three goes on to talk about the strength and what shoulder, the strength of the creator. Think about the size and the strength of a tiger. If that's how strong a tiger is, how strong must the creator be? He's a, again, it's in awe of it. With what shoulder and what art? This idea, again, of the skill involved in creating it. Again, perhaps a self-conscious nod to himself. What art? could twist the sinews of the heart, suggests the great power, as I've said, the strength and also the delicacy to be able to create this. The sinews of the heart suggest the very fibres, the very being, the essence of this tiger. What kind of creator could do this? And when thy heart began to beat, it's not just the body now we're focusing on, it's the heart as well, the repetition now of the word heart. And when this heart was given life, almost like Frankenstein if we think about more modern day, after Blake was writing, a bit more like Frankenstein, this kind of idea, the heart beginning to beat. And what dread hand! We've got repetition of dread. It questions the courage of the creator to be able to continue his work and to finish the jobs. And there's more body parts mention, mentioned. A question, is this the tiger or the creator that the writer is referring to? What dread hand and what dread feet? What terrible, what, 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 what terrifying, what incredible thing was able to create this? What dread hand and what dread feet? Either way, it's something to dread. It's something to be in awe of, amazed of, but also something to be a little bit scared of. A little bit, again, like this idea of the sublime. Stanza four. We get lots of um, manual working kind of images in this stanza. What the hammer and what the chain, furnace, anvil, Oops, sorry, an anvil. We've got this idea here of word choices being related to Smith's tools, like a blacksmith, somebody who makes things out of metal. The metaphor of the blacksmith suggests someone who's hardworking, careful and deliberate. It's a craftsman. Again, it goes back to this idea of it being an imaginative creator who's done this. It's an imaginative creator who's been able to create this. And again, it's, it's a link back to this idea of the humans as well. Yes, what the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace, the, melt, the, the fire that you melt metal with, in what furnace was thy brain, the creation, what the anvil, boom, doom, doom, that's where you hit, where you'd hammer the metal onto it, what the anvil, what dread grasp, dare its deadly, terrors clasp through these three lines all the smith tools here link to fire the tiger's creation feels more dangerous because of this again tiger tiger burning bright in the forests of the night we've got all these images of a blacksmith of a creator but it's fire that creates it perhaps going back to the previous stanza asking and what deeps or what and or what skies the deeps being hell that's almost suggesting the tiger's been created in hell here. But we've got a working class, which is important as well, a working class job creating this. Again, perhaps Blake is suggesting that the working classes are slightly forgotten about in society, but they're just as important as your politicians and things like this. We've got the mentioning of brain here, another part of the body emphasising intelligence this time, not its strength, not its deadly terrors, its intelligence. And again, for the tiger to be so incredibly intelligent in the way it hunts and the way it does so many things, this creator must be even more intelligent and more imaginative. <clears throat> Again, we've got repetition of this word dare from line seven and eight. It's deadly terrors, a reminder that despite its beauty and its perfection, it has deadly terrors. Deadly, the adverb deadly. The terrors are deadly. Not only is it terrifying, but it's deadly terrifying as well. Deadly terrors. Again, perhaps a link with Satan here. Stanza five, we're nearly there. We get to the most religious of all the stanzas. 
Which is hard to believe given what we've been talking about already, but this is the most overtly religious stanza. We're told, When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who make the lamb make thee the tiger? It's the most Christian stanza. Let's break it down a little bit. This idea of the stars throwing down their spears is an illusion. It's a reference to Satan being cast out of, of heaven. Remember, Satan was once an angel and he got put down to, to, to hell for, for his crimes, if you like, for his sins. We've got the idea of spears. Spears could also be an allusion perhaps to the old Greek, to the old Greek gods such as Zeus. It's also a violent imagery, that idea of throwing down spears. Well, you're only throwing spears to kill something. It's a hunting, it's a tool for hunting. But we've got beautiful imagery of when the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears. It's just referring to Satan being cast out of heaven. Watered heaven. The word choice of watered emphasises the purity of heaven. Water is a very pure thing and is to emphasise the purity of heaven here. We're asked, did he? Now what's interesting, interesting, is this the same he that's mentioned in line 7 and the next line? It's interesting that he's not capitalised. It's not made into a proper noun with a capital H as we usually do when referring to God, for example. So the use of the lowercase h and he really emphasises that Blake is still not sure if it's the god or the devil who's created this. It downplays the importance, at least emphasises the uncertainty that one god or the specific Christian god created the tiger. And did he smile as work to see, was he happy? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Made in the past tense, make in the present tense, as if it's, it's almost as if that Blake's the first person to see this beast. The word lambs are name usually given to Christ. Very, very often and very commonly we refer to Christ as being the lamb. The speaker's asking if it's the same person who created Christ, God, as created the tiger. But it's also if it's not the, la the if it's not the person who made the lamb, if it's not God, it therefore stands to reason it's probably the devil who's created this tiger. The link to the gods of the Old and New Testament as well, and the idea of the wrathful God, the dangerous God. Question for you. How and why would a good God want to create something so scary and so dangerous? And this is a question you've really got to consider. If it is this God, this Christian God that's created it, why? It's a killer. Why would he do this? And we get to stanza six, which is exactly the same as stanza one, except the word could in line four of stanza one is changed to dare, this famous word dare that we keep on seeing. It's repetition again. Could in the final stanza is changed to dare, and it maintains and it re-establishes that chant-like quality. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. What a mortal hand or I dare frame thy fearful symmetry. It's very chant-like and it just emphasises it. The poem starts and ends with this stanza and it almost just goes full circle and it allows us to hear this rhythm, this chant-like quality. The word choice of dare, it's the fourth time it's now been repeated. It's identical repetition in the first stanza except this word. So it emphasises this word dare. As we were saying earlier on, who would dare have the courage to create this? Or who would dare have the stupidity almost to create this tiger? Okay, and in a few questions for you. In this poem with all the imagery of fire and danger, alluding to the fact that either the tiger is a reincarnation or created by the tiger, why would... God have created this. Now you may have your own ideas and that's what I'm wanting. Think on this question. Whatever way you want to see it, you can read this poem as God questioning it, sorry, as God creating it or as the devil creating it. It's up to you. It's Poetry is meant to be read many different ways. All you need to do is make sure that you've got the evidence to back it up. What implications does this have with regards to humanity and belief as well? If it is the devil who's created this this tiger. Well, what else did he create? Are all bad things created by the devil? 
Is the devil therefore almost as power, powerful as God? Is there a God? Is there a devil? All these questions being asked. Okay. And is it a reminder that good and evil both exist and they're essential to provide a balance in the world? Perhaps the, if you're not sure and you've not got a clear opinion on it, maybe this is how you want to take it. Do we need to have good and evil in the world to create this balance? That's something to think about. Okay, so we get to the rhyme scheme of the poem. Now, the rhyme scheme of the tiger really is very, very simple. Remember, to work out the rhyme scheme, we're just rhyming the final word of each line. So we've got bright and night, I and symmetry. Now, we read it as symmetry to force it to rhyme with the word I to allow the rhyme scheme to really function successfully. Also remember in Blake's day, these sorts of words would have been said differently. They didn't speak in exactly the same way that we necessarily do nowadays. Even think about my accent being Scottish, I sound very different to an English person who would read it. So we've got bright and night, eye and symmetry. In the second stanza, we've got skies, eyes, aspire and fire. Therefore, really simply, A, A, B, B, Okay, skies doesn't rhyme with anything else, so C, C, D, D. Bright and night rhyme, so we give it the letter A. I and symmetry rhyme, we give it the letter B. Skies doesn't rhyme with anything that we've seen before, so it's C, as is eyes, and aspire and fire are Ds. So, very simply, because it's so rhythmic and it's all the same kind of pattern all the way through, we simply say that it's got an A, A, B, B rhyme scheme. Now this rhyme scheme, a little bit like a song, it adds to this chant-like quality of the poem. As we've been saying, it's almost as if he's trying to evoke the spirit or the creator of this tiger. And the rhyming coupled with the form and metre of the poem just allow that chant-like quality to really come through. So on to form and metre. Many people find this the most difficult part of poetry. I'm going to create another video that's going to explain it to you in more depth, but hopefully this will give you a better understanding of the form and meter, certainly of the tiger. So, the form and meter, it is mostly trochaic, a stressed syllable followed by an unstressed syllable. Tiger, tiger, burning, bright, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed. The stressed at the end is an extra one. You could argue he used the trochaic rather than the iambic rhythm to explore another way of doing things. Lots of poems you will study are written in the iambic pentameter, favourited by Shakespeare, of course, of all people. What Blake is doing here is he's decided to utilise the trochaic style. Perhaps, again, just another reflection of him being against the normal way of doing things. He's exploring another way of doing things. Just like he's exploring who could have created such a beast as the tiger, he's looking to show his rebellious side by using the other another style of uh, another style of form and meter to it. He's using trochaic instead of iambic. There are six quatrains of rhyming couplets. A quatrain is a big posh fancy word for simply a stanza that has four lines in it. A quatrain of rhyming couplets being the A, A, B, B and so on. You could argue that the rhyming couplets mixed with the form and metre of it really echoes the steady sound of a smith working metal. The do-do, 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 do-do sound. And the rhyme scheme also helps to create that. Okay, let me show you then. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. What a mortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry. Stressed, unstressed all the way through. Now we group these together into what we call feet. And I'm going to show you a little bit more here. We can see that both stanzas, first stanza, and the second have very similar form and meter. This is what help makes it so rhythmic and helps it be so chant-like. In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? Stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed. These extra stressed syllables at the end of the lines we don't worry about it. We round down in poetry when we're trying to find out the metre, which I'm going to go on and explain. 
you call these extra syllables at the end catalexis, okay? And again, it's a good technical word to be able to use within your essays. Let me explain in a little bit more depth. So, a foot contains one stressed and at least one unstressed uh, syllable within it, okay? There are other variations. But a foot contains at least one stressed and one unstressed syllable. A stressed syllable followed by an unstressed syllable is called the trochi, which makes it trochaic, just like an iamb makes it iambic. So this, these trochies make it trochaic. There are one, two, three of those groups together. So you group them together, the three of them, plus the catalexis at the end. These three feet, a feet is what we call the pairing of the stressed followed by unstressed, or unstressed followed by stressed. But this feet, there's three of them on a line, so it's called a trimeter. Therefore, the, poem, the form and metre of the poem is trochaic tri trimeter. Trochaic trimeter with the catalexis at the end, but we call it trochaic trimeter. And this is the form and meter of the poem. And it's consistent because it runs all the way through. Okay, the themes. What themes are here? Within your poem and within your essay, sorry, you've got to be explaining the themes. So, the themes that we see present in the tiger are religion, the awe and amazement of this tiger and the creator, and also literature, art, and writing. Let me explain. He's questioning God. Uh, questioning God was something rarely ever done in Blake's day. The church held great authority over the land. People wouldn't question God. Blake did all throughout his career, and especially within this poem. So religion's a theme. Remember, a theme is something, an idea which is repeated throughout the poem. So religion is certainly a theme. He challenges who could have created this beast, God or something else, the devil more than likely. The idea of awe and amazement. As we said, the sublime. This is something big, scary and terrifying. Something which humans couldn't comprehend, couldn't understand, couldn't get their heads around. Yet it was still amazing to them. And that's what this idea of the sublime is. So God, the devil, the creator of this tiger is the sublime. We see, we see Blake wrestling with who could have created it all throughout the poem. And finally, we see literature, art and writing as a theme. Again, he's self-consciously writing about the writing process, about drawing, but about the writing process. Specifically, visionary poetry, which communicates deep, deep truths to ourselves as humans. He's writing about the writing process. He's actually admitting it's difficult to write about such a difficult subject, and even more difficult for him to frame, frame, this argument in poetry. This is why he doesn't offer us an answer. It's very self-reflective. He's self-conscious that he's also a creator, but he's really not offering us an answer because he's, through the theme of literature, art and writing, he's admitting he has no answer. It's such a big, complex idea. He can't begin to really come to a conclusion himself and to be able to write it. So he's kind of looking at the difficulties of writing this sort of poem as well. Okay, the symbols in the poem. What symbols are there? Well, we see first of all the tiger being a symbol, absolutely. Body part being symbolic as well, and fire. With the tiger, the symbol of the tiger, the tiger symbolizes the fierce force within the human soul. We can look at it this way, it's awe and jealousy. Perhaps Blake wishes he was as strong and powerful and dangerous as the tiger. It represents the ferocity within human soul. That's what the tiger in this poem is a symbol of. It's also a symbol of inspiration, both artistic creation and it's mysterious, it's powerful. We also see humanity's rebellious side. It will rise against the established rules and conventions. A little bit like Blake himself supporting the American and French revolutions. So even questioning who could have created this, questioning God. The tiger represents this as well. It doesn't follow anyone else's rules. It's the apex predator of the forest, of the jungle. It does what it wants. And perhaps that's something that sometimes we lack the confidence to do as humans. Perhaps especially nowadays. Body parts, hands, not paws. 
eyes, shoulders, feet and heart are all mentioned, provides us with snapshots of the body and it increases the mysteriousness. We're only seeing part by part by part of the tiger through the poem, almost as if it's being revealed, revealed to us. And as I said, it has this kind of Frankenstein kind of quality to it as well. It also connects the tiger to humans, so it allows this connection between our rebellious side <clears throat> and also the fact that we also have quite a lot of these shoulders, the feet, the heart. We share a lot of these characteristics. So again, emphasising our connection, perhaps man's lost connection, especially modern day, to nature. And this is what he's trying to emphasise. The body parts symbolise the connection between humanity and the tiger and also therefore the creator as well as we're asked about the as we're told about the creator having hands and feet <clears throat> and fire it's an extended metaphor which runs throughout the poem it's otherworldly it's not from this world and there's a connection to hell the way he connects it to humans is by having the analogy of the blacksmith and uh, creating all his different the different uh, items and the different tools that he creates through the use of metal the hard work the delicacy but also everything is forged in the fire a little bit perhaps like the devil now we've also got the fire of the furnace is the tool for creation just like the furnace helps the blacksmith to create tools and work metal the fire within this poem metaphorically has helped to create the tiger now if the fires help to create the tiger you could argue there's a closer link to the devil there, but I'll let you decide. It's a source of energy. The tiger's full of it to be able to be burning bright, okay? Fire is a source of energy. We use it for all sorts of different things. When we're burning it, energy is obviously taking place. And that this tiger is full of this fire. It's full of the danger. It's full of the, the ferocity. The tiger is burning bright. So, I hope this video has helped to show you the different ways that, that Blake has written this poem and the different poetic techniques he has used in which to create it. It really is an incredible poem and it does force us many, many to ask many, many difficult questions. Especially remember in the 21st century, in 2019, no, perhaps in the secular world, these questions about God are more openly asked and, and questioned. And there's, especially in the UK, not as many people believe in, the UK, in, in, in God as they previously did. But in Blake's day, this was hugely controversial. You couldn't question these sorts of things in public and Blake dared to do just that. Please leave some comments below, like and subscribe obviously as you do on YouTube and let me know what you think. What's missing from this video? What should I be adding for next time? All these sorts of things I want to know, okay? I will also create a shorter version of this closer to the exam period, a 5-10 minute one that just gives you the key facts. But with this video I hope you've got a better understanding of the context of who William Blake was the time he was running in, and the poem. What it means, what questions it asks. Remember the poetic techniques, you're not just saying this is a metaphor, you've got to say what the metaphor suggests. Okay, until next time.